Hello everyone, my name is Marcus Miller. I'm currently pursuing my PhD at Clemson University and I am under Dr. Susan Duckett. Today I get the privilege of talking about USDA meat grading and how that affects what we do. <clears throat> So let's start with a little bit of the history. Uh, the Meat Inspection Act of 1906 was brought about by an individual named Upton Sinclair. He actually wrote the book The Jungle as a human rights movement. Um, they were treating immigrant workers very, very poorly uh, at the turn of the century, and he just couldn't abide by it. So he went into actually the meat packing plants and noted what they were doing. And when he published his book, the atrocities against the food industry were so horrible that the government was forced to act. So this Meat Inspection Act came about. It established what meat was. So it defined beef, pork, and lamb as meat. In 1916, the USDA was like, well, we have so many different carcasses. This heterogeneous group needs to become more homogeneous. So they decided to make a grading system. In 1916, the USDA established the basis for what was the National Meat Market Reporting Service. This was the what led up to the official United States standards for the grades of beef carcasses that were established in 1926. Fun fact, in 1906, the Meat Inspection Act established what was meat, but in 1957, I believe, there was a Poultry Inspection Act, which defined what poultry was. So if anybody ever argues with you, or you can argue with somebody, what meat actually is, it is not chicken, because chicken and turkey are technically poultry, and are a meat substitute. So I will start with beef grading. I think this is what we're going to spend the, ma <clears throat> the majority of our time in, looking at yield grading first, followed by quality grading. So yield grading predicts cutability or closely trimmed retail cuts and it gives you a grade numbered 1 through 5 USDA yield grade 1 being a very trim heavy muscled high yielding carcass USDA yield grade 5 being a fat light muscled low yielding carcass. So we started off with bases derived from industry averages and we're going to adjust away from those depending on how heavy muscle or fat the carcass is. So this is looking at just the amount of closely trimmed retail cuts that we're going to get for cutability. So PYG, which is the preliminary yield grade, is measured in uh, tenths of fat. Okay, so whenever we rib the beef carcass between the 12th and 13th rib, three quarters up the ribeye, we measure and measure the subcutaneous fat and for every tenth of an inch of fat we adjust the PYG up uh, 0.25 PYG so if a carcass had zero tenths of fat he would have 2.0 PYG if he had one tenth of fat he would have a 2.25 PYG and that is a preliminary yield grade okay now we're moving on to the ribeye area, or REA. So the basis for that is 11 square inches. So this is when you have to use a little bit of common sense. Is more muscle good or is more muscle bad? If more muscle is good, then we're going to subtract. If more muscle is bad, well, more muscle is good. Let's just leave it at that less muscle is bad so if it has below 11 inches we're going to add to the to the yield grade if it has a mo uh, more than 11 inches we're going to subtract because we want to get that yield grade as low as we can okay so a carcass with an 11.3 inch ribeye would have a minus 0.1 adjustment an 11.6 inch ribeye would have a minus 0.2 adjustment Okay. Now I know there's some numbers in between that. However, you just average out whichever one's closer and you go with the nearest adjustment. Okay. 
the same is true for the other side of 11 square inches. If it has a 10.7 inch ribeye, you're going to add 0.1. All right, now we'll have some examples that'll hopefully clear this up. Now, hot carcass weights are pretty standard. The base is 600. So for every 25 pounds over or under 600, we're going to adjust plus or minus 0.1. So a heavier carcass should have more muscle. So that's why we're going to add as it gets heavier. It's going to subtract as it gets lighter. So a carcass with a weight of 575 pounds would have an adjustment of minus 0.1. And a, a carcass with 625 pounds would have an adjustment of plus 0.1. All right? It's just very simple math once you understand what the bases are. KPH stands for kidney, pelvic, and heart fat, and it's expressed in a percentage of the carcass weight. So 3.5% would equal an adjustment of zero. So for every percent, half a percent, plus or minus 3.5, we're going to add or subtract 0.1. So if it has 4%, that's more fat than 3.5%. More fat is bad, so we're going to add 0.1. If it has 3%, less fat is good, we're going to subtract 0.1. Now you just have to remember that we want the overall yield grade to be as low as possible. That's the most desirable outcome. So let's do two examples. So I've got carcass 1 and carcass 2. Carcass 1 has 2 tenths of an inch of fat, a 14.6 inch ribeye, 855 pounds, and 3% kidney, pelvic, and heart fat. All right. Carcass number two has 6 tenths of fat, 10.3 inch ribeye, 575 pounds, 4.5% kidney, pelvic, and heart fat. So let's look at the adjustments. 2 tenths of fat would equal a PYG of 2.5. So we remember that our base is 2.0. And for every tenth of an inch of fat, we adjust up 0.25. So two quarters is 50 cents. It's pretty easy whenever you think of it like that. So that's how you come up with 2.5. 14.6 inches squared. All right, so 14.6. We're going to subtract that from 11, multiply by 0.3, all right, and end up with a final adjustment of 1.2. Or... The more correct way would be to count every three tenths from 11. So 11, 11, 3, 11, 6, 11, 9, 12, 2, 12, 5, 12, 8, 13, 1, 13, 4, 13, 7, 14, 0 is 1. So we have 14 inches as an adjustment of minus 1.0, 14.3, and 14, 14.6 give us 1.2. So he has more muscle than 11.0, so we're going to subtract. 850 pounds, an adjustment of 1. All right, so for every 25 pounds, we adjust plus 0.1 above 600. 3% kidney, pelvic, and heart fat is less than 3.5%. So we're going to subtract 0.1, because less fat is better. Okay, so that gives us a final yield grade of 2.2, or a yield grade 2. Let's move on to carcass 2, 1.6 inches in fat, a PYG of 3.5. So we have our ribeye here, and it's lighter than 11 point square inches, so we're going to add, because less muscle is bad, so an adjustment of plus 0.3. Now 575 pounds is a lighter carcass, so that's kind of why you'd expect him to have a lower ribeye area. So you have an adjustment of minus 0.1. Okay, so remember our base is 600. And it's lighter than 600, so we subtract 0.1. If it was over 600, we'd add, just like in the last example. 4.5% kidney, pelvic, and heart fat. More fat is bad, so we're going to adjust up. 3.5 is our base. We get a final yield grade of 3.9 or a yield grade 3. Now, I didn't say earlier, but in terms of the industry, there is an allowable amount of fat that we can have. So yield grades 1, 2, and 3 are 
considered within the allowable range. Yield grades 4 and 5 are heavily discounted because the amount of fat that they have is simply going to go to waste. The packer can't use all of the fat that yield grade 4 or 5 would have, so they discount the carcass. So it's very important whenever we're quali uh, quality and yield grading, or whenever we're yield grading, to make sure that we're doing ac as accurately as possible because the yield grade 4 is a heavily discounted carcass. Okay. So let's move on to quality grade. So the factors that impact quality grading are the kind of meat, sex, maturity, and marbling. This has the greatest impact on palatability for beef. Okay, It's a very good predictor of what uh, the carcass is going to taste like. Now, this was developed quite a long time ago, and until now, we haven't found anything else that predicts quality as well as the US grading system. Recently, however, the US and actually it was started in Australia, so the Australian by the name of Rod Polkinghorn devised a grading system that actually beats ours in terms of predicting consumer acceptability. So it can actually go in and with a 95% accuracy tell you what you're going to think about this piece of beef regardless of how you like your beef cooked okay so it's pretty interesting there's a fun fact for you I'm always interested in things like that um, if you want to look it up it's the meat standards of Australia and while the exact systems not perfected yet the model is definitely in place for a high success for that um, they've also started comparing not only Australian together but also Australia to US um, Australia to Europe and European countries so because Australia is kind of the nucleus of where that started we're able to tell how different consumers around the world like certain beef which is pretty interesting um, let's start with sex so you can identify the sex uh, in steers by an irregular grape cluster or cod fat uh, from where the testes were before they were um, Mm, removed. Uh, bulls and bullocks have a large pizzle eye, which is where the penis attaches, and a pizzle muscle, and they also have a pronounced neck crest. It's important to identify these because bulls are eligible for yield grade only. All right, um, heifers and cows both have a smooth sex or udder fat and a kidney bean lean shape. So the kidney bean lean shape refers to the carcass uh, hindquarter, where you can actually see a kidney bean shaped lean. So that's there mainly because they don't have the sex fat um, from the penis going through there to attach to the pizzoli that the, that the males do. Maturity is an extremely important part of uh, quality grading. It's telling the grader what quality grades the carcass is actually um, viable for. Okay, So we're going to go through this and in the end I'll explain the quality grades to you. So young maturity is A or B final maturity, and they're eligible for prime choice select and standard. Old is eligible for uh, C, D, and E final maturity, and those would be your commercial, utility, and cutters. All right. If you'll notice, I have an asterisk next to B final maturity, and that is because as the animal ages, they tend to be tougher and have an impact on the final eating experience. So we require a higher degree of marbling in the ribeye in order for them to grade uh, as an a, as the same as an A maturity carcass. Okay, so let's look a little bit at those marbling quality grades. So starting in the bottom right would be a low choice. I'm sorry, would be a select followed by a low choice, which is small. Uh, modest and moderate would be your top choice, and those would be what certified, certified Angus beef falls onto. Slightly abundant and moderately abundant are prime, and those are what about 2% of all of the beef that's graded in the United States today falls under. So I'm sorry for the picture. It came straight out of the uh, AMSA Meat Science Handbook, so it was just kind of tough to get that perfect for me. Okay, so now we're going to look and see what happens when maturity and marbling combine. Okay, 
So we have, let's say we have an A maturity carcass with average choice marbling, which would be modest. So we'd come over here and say A, and we'd find our modest A's choice. Okay. Well, what about an A with small marbling? That would be low choice. Okay. Now let's move over to a B and look at B with a low choice. Okay. That would fall to standard. So you can see that it totally negates the select quality grade, which is the type of meat that you would find at Walmart, as well as the low choice. These would be what you would find at Walmart. Okay. So the eating experience is not going to be there with this amount of marbling for a B maturity carcass. All right. Now moving on to older cattle, we see that these guys mostly end up in ground beef and your pre-packaged, pre-flavored roasts. You can see those tenderloin steaks at the grocery store. They have the bacon already wrapped around them and they're in a solution. That's probably your C, D, C or D maturity carcasses. All right. So the way that you read this chart, find your C, find your degree of marbling, and follow it over. Now, within commercial and utility, there is a high average and low, and a high average and low. I've actually never seen a cutter carcass, because usually they have at least a degree of marbling. However, I can assume that some of the old, old dairy cows that have been under stress might end up there. All right, let's switch gears and get into pork a little bit. So, when in terms of quality of pork, we're looking at acceptable or unacceptable quality. Um, pork is not going to be strictly sold on the quality, okay? It's mainly uh, cutability. Now, the Japanese do prefer a certain type of colored pork or a certain colored type of pork. Um, so they go through and they pick a little bit darker color than what we're used to here. So they do grade on quality. Um, however, in the U.S., it's mainly cutability. All right, so they're, they're given a U.S. score of U.S. 1 through 4 or U.S. utility. All right, so the formula for this is very simple. It's four times the last rib back fat minus the muscle score. Okay, so that is tells you exactly how much they're uh, basing their whole, gr whole grade around the last rib back fat. So that's just pretty indicative. Now the muscle scores are given on a basis of one through three, okay, with one being very thick, heavy muscle, large ham, large loin, thick shoulder, um, and if it doesn't have at least a muscle score two, which is average, then it is ineligible for U.S. number one, okay. Now that just gives us a very general estimate of cutability. If we look down here at the fat-free lean, these formulas are what most companies use nowadays. Um, they, I've given you the unribbed and the ribbed version. Most of the carcasses are unribbed um, because it is a lot easier to affect the quality of pork than it is beef. So they try and limit the amount of damage that they do. Now, if you want... There are other formulas that you can look up for this, like fatometer and other certain things. But uh, this are the these are the two that I've used in my life. So if you're really wanting to calculate a pork carcass, here it is for you. Now let's take a look at lamb. So lamb quality becomes quite a bit more important, and the yield grade is just very uh, pretty much stands alone. It's purely based upon the adjusted fat thickness of the back. Okay, so they're giving a yield grade from one through five. And that has a semi-accurate prediction of the total total uh, lean cuts that you're gonna get. But lamb focuses a little bit more on quality. Okay. So we'll look at confirmation, lean color, maturity, uh, which are the rib and the brake joints and flank streakings. Okay, let's move on. So flank streakings are the marbling of lamb. All right. So right here you can kind of see the uppermost portion where the gloved hand is. If you follow that white all the way down to that red ridge, that would be the primary flank streakings. 
that red ridge that runs right beneath that layer, those are the secondary fling streakings. All right, so you can see the fat that layers over that as you move to the right. So that coupled with the confirmation down here, so you can see prime, low prime, average choice, low choice, and good. Good carcasses are extremely light muscled and are heavily discounted. Okay. So that just kind of gives you an idea of the muscling conformation for land. Now, if we're thinking maturity, we need to look specifically at the break joints. So as the carcass is hanging upside down, the uh, worker goes through and attempts to break the joint off. Just He just cuts it and tries to break it off. And if it's not fused, meaning it is young, then it will see a break joint like uh, the number one that is shown there. But if it has a spool joint, like in number two, that is more indicative of an older carcass. So they don't discount lambs for having one spool joint. But if they have two spool joints and both are completely fused, then they call that mutton. Okay, so that's very, very, very important to know. Is two spool joints is very bad. One spool joint is okay. Two break joints is extremely young. Well, I hope you learned something. I don't know where that drum roll came from, so I apologize for that. But uh, I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. I've enjoyed doing, uh, getting to present it. And hopefully, if you have any questions, you can come talk to me. I'd be more than happy to discuss meat with you. It's one of the favorite things that I get to do with my life. So I hope you all have a great weekend. I look forward to hearing some feedback.